Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Available on Apple Podcasts and Podcast One. Welcome, you're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. That's Tim Dennis. It's Sunday. Tim, we're creeping closer to 2020. A whole new year, a whole new decade about to begin. Are you ready for the big changeover? Only if Barbara Walters is going to host the uh, midnight celebration. Why, why Barbara Walters, of all people? Because when the ball drops, I want to hear her say, I'm Barbara Walters and this is 2020. Oh my God! Yeah, I, that, I just, all right. Good night, everybody. I'm yeah. shutting on the show. <laughs> no, that's uh, yeah. 2020, dude. Can you believe it? 2020. How is that even possible? I don't know. I, I want. You know what's so weird to me is it's this is 20 years now since the 1990s ended, which is impossible because wasn't the 80s just 20 years ago? Uh, no, 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 Dave. It was. It feels that way. It was closer to forty. Shut um, up. Oh my god, that's so sickening. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to believe. Hard to believe. Time is flying. Hopefully, everybody in twenty twenty can use this uh, as a new visionary year. Tim, see what I did there? I see what a visionary you did. year. Yeah. yeah, to make a new life, set new intentions, set new goals. I don't know that I necessarily believe in in. Uh, what is that thing you do in the new year? You, you, um, resolutions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think setting intention is better than setting resolutions, right? Resolving to quit this or not do that or do this. Just make an intention for a better year. Start, start kind of contributing to that aspect of your life. Get control of your life again. That's all I'm asking. That's a good, uh, good start. Yeah. That's a, a better start than resolving. I think. Resolutions are, are thrown out uh, like, uh, I don't want to say like a baby with the bathwater because it's a whole lot of babies being thrown out. But um, yeah. yeah, it's I, I think uh, an intention is is uh, better served. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. Resolutions are kind of like um, are kind of like uh, Vikings Super Bowl championships, Tim. They're non-existent. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> that's what I'm finding. Yeah. So uh, we've got that going for us. All right, let's uh, let's get to it. You know, I, being in Minnesota, Tim, I'm always learning about new history of our state. Mm-hmm. I've been living here now 30, can you believe this, 31 years, Tim. Wow. I've been an official Minnesotan for 30. I, now that I've lived here longer than I lived in, in Illinois, which was my first 20, 21 years, mm-hmm. am I now officially a Minnesotan? I don't know. I saw you wearing a Bears jersey online the other day, so I. Uh, but it's Dick Dick Butkus. Yeah, but it was still. a throwback Butkus jersey, Although... and I grew up in Chicago, so I'm a Vikings fan. Uh, it almost burns my tongue to say that. Although I'm a Vikings fan first, and then Bears second. Although I'll give you this, I do own a Walter Payton jersey, so yeah, you're in oh. Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. See, it's a classic. It's not like I was wearing a Mitchell Trubisky jersey, Tim. Yeah, they, if for, you'd uh, you'd have yeah. to burn in hell for that one. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. So, uh, so I've been in Minnesota. I love to learn about Minnesota legend and lore, and especially where it comes to hauntings. Tim. Oh yeah, yeah. And we've got a haunting to uncover the oh. Boyd House. Right? Yeah. How cool is this? We've got a guest joining us who has an interesting story to share with us. Jill Shelley has been investigating the paranormal and is so fascinated by it, bought a a haunted house. Jill, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave and Tim. So were you always fascinated with the paranormal and then got a, a haunted house? Or did you get a haunted house and that's what inspired your fascination? with the paranormal? Oh, I've, I've always been into the paranormal since I was young. You know, I was always fascinated by ghosts and all the 
oddly worldly things growing up and had a few experiences as a young child. And, you know, I'm quite a bit older, so we didn't have internet. So back in the day, you'd go to the library and read and learn and study, and you just never what really is thought this, of being a ghost hunter. What is this library you speak of? Library? <laughs> Is that yes, a... people don't know what libraries are anymore. <laughs> no, they don't. No, they don't. Um, yeah, but yeah, we would. I would just learn and study that way. And then about 10, well, a little over 10 years ago, um, you know, with the highlights of all the ghost hunting shows that came out, of course, everybody jumped on the bandwagon, but I got a group of volunteers that I've met people who were into the paranormal. And we kind of formed our group, St. Croix Paranormal, and started our own group and traveled all across the country to well-known haunted locations. And that's, uh, that started everything. But as we go to all these places, I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be fun to have your own haunted location? And so this year was a financial year and something I was able to do. It was a dream I always had. So I was able to fulfill that dream um, earlier this spring. And then we ended up opening up the house in June for other investigators to come in. All right. Well, th- talk to me. I mean, having an you know an interest in it throughout your life, what spurred that interest for you? Um, I don't know. I think I was just maybe born that way, just kind of interested in that kind of thing. And my first experience was at um, my grandmother's house, which I always thought one room was kind of eerie. Kind of, I never liked it in there at all. I don't know what it was. So I felt like somebody's watching me, and then you just didn't feel welcome in that room, and it was always super cold. And they always said, oh, it's because it faces the north. I'm, and I didn't feel like that's why it was that way. I just didn't like it. So One you night felt, I heard you felt that there was something. There was something. It felt more like there was nervous. something more to that room than just, you know, it's cold because it faces the north. And one night when we were sleeping, I was awoken in the middle of the night and I heard footsteps come out of the room and it stood at my door. And it was so, you know, and when I was probably maybe like seven or eight years old. So at this point, I'm terrified and I won't turn around and look, but you could feel it like staring through you almost like just so intense. It's so hard to explain. And then you heard like a big, huge sigh and it turned around and it walked back into the back into that room. And of course, then I got up after a, a few minutes and turned on the lights and put my head under the covers, the whole thing the kids do. Um, spoke to my grandma about it the next morning and she just said, Oh honey, that's just a ghost and he's not going to hurt you. So then after that, I kind of go, got minute, over my minute, whole fear. So grandma was just <laughs> complacent about, Oh, it's just a ghost. Did she ever yeah, open she up? A she ghost? She, no, no, she didn't really. I guess at, at that age, I was just like, okay, well, grandma says, so went about my day. <laughs> so, you know. But, but ghosts, that always seems to terrify kids. It didn't for you? Was it because she was so matter of fact about it? Well, it did. It scared me when it happened. And then, like I said, I was obviously probably upset and worried about it the next day. That's why I spoke with her. But I guess in my mind, because my grandmother was an extremely religious person, and I kind of felt like for her to say that, it just made me so comforted. Like, oh, it isn't anything to be scared of. So that's just kind of how I was. And then then the whole fascination of let's learn all about it. You know, what can we learn? So that's do you think, kind of do you think that was from. relative? Um, or do you think it was a spirit that uh, had been in the house prior to your grandmother living there? Well, they built that house. So it had to be either something from the land or maybe somebody from the past in their family that, you know, she never brought up or something. So I guess we we never, now that she's passed away, it was, you know, I hadn't been in investigating that it would have been kind of fun to go back into her house to see what was there, but. Oh, gosh. Uh, all right. So that was, that was kind of your getting your toes wet with the, with the paranormal. Did it continue on throughout your life or was it very sporadic? Um, no, I, like I said, I did the studying and of course, you know, watch all the movies, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it's not like I had any more experiences than that. I just found the whole thing fascinating and interesting. And it just, I don't know, it just sparked a really good interest in me. Yes. And then what became a hobby kind of became a business, I guess. <laughs> and the 
type of hauntings that you experienced before owning this house? I mean, that was, you could hear footsteps, you could hear somebody breathe and walk away. Had you ever had visual contact, seeing a ghost or a spirit? Um, the only one time, and this is, you know, of course, now that we've been investigating and gone to well-known places, of course, we've had different experiences. Uh, the only time I did see a actual vision with my own eyes, and I guess it wasn't even a vision, it was more like a shadow, uh, was at a bar down in downtown Stillwater. Um, we were just up on the upper floor, so it's obviously it wasn't somebody walking down on the street below. The room got really, really ice cold, and I remember making a comment of, oh my gosh, because it was like 95 degrees out. I was like, oh my goodness, it is like freezing in here all of a sudden, like way beyond what it was. And then we just happened to, me and the, one of my investigators, just happened to look up at the same time, and we saw this black shadow go across the window. And we both looked at each other and like, did you just see that? And she's like, I did just see that. So that was probably like our first, and for me, the only time I've actually seen something other than I've felt something or I've heard something. Now, in the places that you've investigated, let's let's touch on a few of those before we get into your your home. Um, what are some of the famous locations that you've investigated? Uh, we've done like Waverly Hills Sanitarium. I know a lot of people know that one's a really good one. We've done the Randolph Infirmary, and people are starting to know a little bit more about that. Ashmore State. Where, where is the Randolph Infirmary? That is in Indiana. I can't remember exactly which city that was, but uh, that was actually just on one of those. Uh, I think Dakota just had that on his show. Dakota Layden? Um, but we actually, yeah, yeah. We um, actually had seen, uh, captured what appeared to be a shadow figure there. We didn't see it, but Teresa, my other investigator, earlier in the night when we were setting up in the basement, actually saw like a black shadow peeking around a corner while she was getting the camera ready. And then later we captured one up on the upper floor on film, but we didn't see it at the time because we were just kind of panning through the hallways. And again, it had the same, looks like it peeks out at you and then runs across the door, you know, like it wants to make sure you don't see it or something. But yeah, we've had, we've had that. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the Velisca X murder house. We've been there a couple of times. A lot of people know that one. Now, what about that? You know, I mean, I've, we've heard on our show for years different experiences. What was your take on it? Does it live up to the expectations? For Velisca? Yes. I, I, the first time we went there, we had a ton of activity. Like, we had little rocks being thrown at us from upstairs because they have, like, one of those old floor grates. So little rocks were falling down and, and shooting at us. Uh, we had some interaction with some of the equipment going off, and we got some excellent EVPs of the children, like even talking to each other. One said, do you want to play? And the other one said, no way. Um, we had the one boy telling Lena the EVP was no, Lena, no. Um, but we had a really good time. We went back maybe like four or five years later, and it, it, to me, it had a totally different feel. So I don't know if it was just the particular day, that we were there or if things have really changed at the house. When we went, they hadn't been open, you know, maybe a couple of years, you know, now, now it's been so long that, you know, it's just crazy. I don't know if it's too many people have been there and they don't want to interact. I'm not sure. All right. So those were, those are some of the big ones that you had a, a chance to investigate. I'm just curious, were there any major hotspots that you heard about that your team went to that just seemed completely dead, flat, no energy, nothing there? Because I know that's happened to Tim and I from time to time. We hear such outrageous claims and stories, and you get to a place, and even though neither one of us are really a medium or psychic at all, it just, uh, you, to me, it's no different than standing in an open field somewhere. Yeah, there's, um, there's one we went to, and um, we didn't get anything all night. You know, they've had claims of different things. And then we were at a rectory one time that had all those claims of evil and Satan. And, you know, we were all like, okay, nobody goes off by themselves in this place, you know, just because it had such a hype of, of evil activity. And we didn't get that feel at all. Next thing you know, we're all over the place. And, you know, <laughs> so it's like 
we did, I don't even think we got anything actually at all that evening. So, yeah. well, and I understand and for listeners too. I mean, I don't want us to sound uh, jaded, but you know, the, we understand paranormal activity is not going to happen everywhere, but you can still go into right. a place that's known to be haunted. And even though you may not get any activity, it still just has that energy about it. Right. That feel. Yeah. But then there are some places that I've gone to that are completely devoid of any energy or, you know, it's like somebody just dropped a mobile home, you know, brand new mobile home straight out of the packaging onto a plot of Holy land. You know I mean? It couldn't be any more <laughs> devoid of energy or activity than that. But no, I, you know, I am curious you said, oh, yeah, this, this place, this rectory, uh, reportedly so evil, all these stories surround it. Why, why would you go? Explain for listeners why you would go to a place that's reportedly evil to investigate it. Well, I think because we've been doing it for so long, you know, when you first start, you're like, oh, I got an EVP. Oh, they touched the REM pod. But it's almost like you want more. You want to experience a lot more. So I think that's kind of why we go and we've, we've kind of changed our focus now where we want to more know about what's on the other side. Um, but back then we've just kind of wanted to get more of the physical type experiences. Um, our one gal, Teresa, who's on our team, we call her the paranormal punching bag because she's always getting pushed, scratched. Something always physical happens to her. <laughs> so, why, why do you think that um, is? Why is it more attracted to one person over another. And I, I, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot with this regarding your friend, Tim and I have been right. in plenty of locations where we have some repeat offenders. We call them people that come to every one of the events, but they're always the highlight. They're always the one being scratched or bitten or pushed or shoved. Mm -hmm. And it's so overly dramatic. And a few of them, I've just politely said, you know, you, you shouldn't come anymore. And it's not, I don't tell them, I don't want you at my events anymore, but I tell them, listen, if this is really what happens to you and you're so tortured and terrified, why would you continue to put yourself through this? Even with the fascination, right. there's gotta be a point where you're just like, Hey, I don't need to go get my ass kicked. I don't need to get scratched or bitten <laughs> or shoved down a flight of stairs. Why would I right. continue to put myself in that position? And in, you know, in some instances, you can tell that people are looking for more attention in the paranormal than others. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what, why do you feel that your teammate is such a lightning rod for paranormal activity? Yeah, um, you know, we've never really figured that out. We just kind of figured she must have some different type of aura or energy that attracts things to her. Maybe she's really negative on the inside that we don't know about and that tracks negative energy. It, you know, it's hard to say. Does anybody really know why things happen in the paranormal world? We don't. It's always an educated guess, I think, in most instances. Um, but she, I don't know, she just seems to be the one that gets, gets all, you know, and she doesn't she make nervous? like a big production, you know, right. about she it. Is she Nelly, though? Is she the kind that's always flinchy and jumpy? Oh, gosh, no. She's super brave. She'll go off by herself and huh. You know, yeah, so she, she's, you know, her big one, she was sitting in a closet and she got thrown four feet out of the closet. She was in there all by herself. So, you know, it's just different kinds of things that she, maybe she puts herself in too many bad situations. It's hard to say. All right. Well, yeah, it could be numerous things. I always thought, you know, if it's somebody that's jumpy and scary and I was a ghost haunting a place and I knew that they were so spooked and afraid to be there, they would be the first people I would target. Yeah. Yeah. No, she, she's not that a brave I'm, one. <laughs> not that I want to, you know, not that I'm a demon, but it just, to me, it would be funny. That would be the one person I would be going after just to s screw with them. But again, maybe the brave one's the one you want to go after as well, because if they're a hotshot brave, you know, and, and they're the ones that are going to go in and face down the devil, you know, then as a smart ass ghost, they might be the ones I muck with the hardest. So I don't know. That's, yeah. that's my plan for retirement on the other side is simply <laughs> to hang out at well-known haunted places and screw with investigators. Oh gosh. Wouldn't that be fun? I would so love oh, to do definitely. that. Definitely. Until some, one of them figures out how to put me in one of those little traps like they use in Ghostbusters. <laughs> then the, the comic value is gone. I'll have to hire Tim to follow me around as a spirit and get me out of those situations. Should it arise? Yeah. <laughs> so you've got uh 
you've you've got a lot of people on your team that go out and get this type of activity and now it's one thing to go out actively pursuing places that are well known for hauntings what what was your thoughts behind i want to procure a haunted location for myself well i just thought it would always be fun to just go and and just have other people come see what they kind of get what other experiences they get and talk and then you're also meeting new people in the paranormal so you're kind of creating a nice network of good friends the people in the paranormal world I've met are just some of the most awesome people I've ever met but I think it was just just a fascination that I'd have my own I could go do my own research when I wanted to just a place to go hang out the spirits become more comfortable with you to get, and then I feel that they would interact more with you because they get to know you on a regular basis. Um, what I didn't bank on was all the work that came with it, such as mowing lawns and upkeep and that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> but other than that, it's been really good. So wait a minute. You you bring in human souls for the ghosts to feed off of, and they're not even willing to mow the lawn for you or dust once in a while? <laughs> I know. You know, you think they would. We tried to barter with them, but it just wasn't working. Yikes. Uh, that's yeah, that's unfair, Tim. See, ghosts turn out to be just like children, it seems. They only do things when they want to. Mm-hmm. They're not willing to help out around the house. Yep. They're really good at making a lot of loud noises at night when you're trying to sleep. I'm starting to figure this whole thing out, Tim. <laughs> well, you should be so, good with ghosts, then. Yeah, you'd think. I'm not. No? I'm not, Tim. Hmm. Well, You've seen right. Holger Files. I got bit. I got knocked on my ass. The <laughs> ghosts are obviously letting me know that uh, I'm not in charge. I have no power here. Hmm. But you know where I do have power, Tim? Where is that? My TV. Oh. Yeah, because I use Pluto TV. What the hell is Pluto TV, you ask? Well, if you be listening to our show, if you be listening, Tim, that's, that's my new statement. If you be listening. That's great English, by the way. To our show then you would already know about Pluto TV. But I'm going to forgive some of you because maybe you're brand new and haven't heard the good news, Tim. Pluto TV has risen. Mm-hmm. If you are looking to kind of cut the cords from cable, you're tired of paying over prices and, and uh, you know, to get TV and, and movies, Pluto TV is the response for you. Tim and I have already made the switch. Pluto TV is the leading free streaming television service where you can watch... Not over just 10, Tim. Not over 50. Not even over 75 TV channels. Over 100 TV channels. And tens of hundreds of movies, Tim. That's thousands, in case you're not sure how the math goes. (laughs) Hundreds of TV channels. Over 100 TV channels, I should say. And thousands of movies, all on demand, all for free. Now, Tim, I know... I know you don't like giving your credit card over the the internet or over your phone, Tim, because there's many pirates out there looking to snag your your important details. Oh yes, yeah. so that they could finance their lunch meat habit or whatever they could afford with your yours and my limited paychecks from doing radio. Candy, pretty much, yeah. Right, yeah. But so you don't want to use a credit card. I understand that, Tim. Mm-hmm. You don't have to. How about that? That's what Pluto TV did. They made it easy for you. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, what about, do you want to put in, like, your, your date of birth, your home address, which is 314? Uh, Dave, Dave, no? You, no, you don't have oh. to do that with Pluto TV. No, no you don't. You're yeah. right. You don't. You don't have to sign up. Right. Pluto TV is an app that's easy, and it's a completely legal way to watch your favorite TV shows and hit movies. What are you waiting for? Never pay for TV again. Just download Pluto TV for free on all of your favorite devices today. Whether you're streaming on your phone, your Roku, your Amazon Fire TV, your Apple TV, a crystal ball maybe, smart TVs, PlayStation, and Etch-A-Sketch, Tim, wherever you stream, Pluto TV is the answer for you. So don't hesitate. Don't wait. For God's sakes, get with it. Pluto TV. Tim and I have been telling you about it. If you haven't listened now, it's time to act. Remember that new intention setting I talked about for the new year, Tim? Mm-hmm. Intend to save yourself some money. Intend to have hundreds 
of movies, thousands of movies, and over 100 TV channels at your fingertips, all for free, Tim. All for free. No credit card needed, no sign-up needed. Pluto TV, that's the answer for 2020. Get on board, sign up for it now. Tim, the TV show Evil. Oh, It's on CBS. You finally caught up. Mm Mm-hmm. Was I right? You are right. Dude, it's a kick-ass TV show. Oh, Am yeah. I allowed to say that, Tim? Uh, yeah, you can. Yeah. I feel like I'm channeling 1984 Dave Schrader. Dude, it's totally kick-ass. Did you see that? <laughs> Evil is available on CBS All Access, CBS.com, and On Demand. So it's perfect for binge-watching. If you haven't seen it yet, folks, once you get done listening to the show today, check out Evil. Evil is... It's this interesting mystery with clues in every episode leading up to a really chilling season finale. Oh, and there are jump-out-of-your-seat scares and stories of miracles, demonic possession, hauntings, and much more. Katya Herbers plays Kristen Bouchard, a forensic psychologist who's hired by a priest in training played by Mike Coulter. Together with Asif Manfi, they investigate the Catholic Church's background of unexplained mysteries. This, Tim, is a new series for a new time and new era. They look at the darker parts of these stories, and they do it in a fascinating way. Plus, the acting is really good. And the more that these intrepid investigators discover, the more dangerous life is turning out for them. Michael Emerson might be one of the most perfect TV villains I've seen in a long time. He doesn't hide in the shadows. He's out there in the open wreaking havoc, Tim. Mm -hmm. Evil. It's on demand on CBS, CBS cbs.com, and on demand. you got to watch it. Make sure you tune in. Check it out for yourself. And everybody that loves this show is absolutely going to love this program. So if you listen to Beyond the Darkness, for all the cool paranormal aspects, the chills, the thrills, and more, this show was made up for you. So curl up on your sofa, binge this chilling mystery on CBS All Access, CBS.com, or On Demand. It is so worth it. You deserve the best. CBS delivers the best. Check out Evil. All right. We've got our guest on the line, Jill Shelley. Tim, she has a house here in Minnesota. Why we haven't been invited to have a sleep over there, I don't know, Tim. I don't know either. <laughs> maybe she's afraid we'll mess up the place. Well, I can get quite messy. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, maybe she's seen uh, photographs of our own bedroom with Dorito wrappers on the floor, Tim. Could be. Yeah. After drink Slurpee, she's afraid to have us in there. But uh, I think it's time, you know, Tim, we take the show on the road. Maybe we really do. We've been talking about this for a while. Maybe we need to do a live broadcast from a live haunted location. Oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Let's see if we capture any strange ifs, Tim. Ifs. That's electronic voice phenomena. Oh, ifs. Yeah. 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 We could try to do that on the air. Uh, mm-hmm. The Boyd. The Boyd House. Now, Jill, this is this is your special place, and you do allow people in to investigate this house, right? Yeah, we just started allowing people in it in June. I think I purchased it in, it was like maybe March, I think, and it just took us a while to get everything cleaned up and ready and organized to get people to come in and do investigations there. All right, well, what, uh, talk to me about the, the history of this house, and is it, it, it what's, where's the town, where's it located? It's in a little teeny tiny town called Boyd, Minnesota. It's about 145 miles, I believe, southwest of the Twin Cities. We're actually closer to South Dakota. Um, Bigger city that people might know of is uh, Granite Falls. That would be the closest town we're to. Uh, History, we're still working on that a little bit, kind of digging that up as we go along. I do know the house was built in 1901. Uh, but my deed goes back to 1884 when the land was actually owned by the Minneapolis and Pacific Railway. And part of some of the trustees from that owned it, and then part of the founders of the town owned the land and had different plots of the land. I'm finding that information out now. And back in the day, back in the 1900s, Boyd was this huge, booming town. Like, they had restaurants and hotels and all kinds of things, and now it's kind of diminished to, you know, the typical bar, restaurant, gas station. 
Um, but as far as like any deaths right now, I do know there's two confirmed deaths in the house because they were of natural causes. So, and a lot of the names and things that we've been getting from the house so far have not correlated to anybody who's on the deed. So I'm having a feeling what's ever going on is probably tied to the land and not who particularly owned this house. Okay. Now, how did, how did it come to your attention? Well, like I said, I was in the market for looking for a haunted house and it's kind of hard to just, you know, Hey, want to buy a haunted house? Where do I find one? So I just, you know, did the old MLS search, you know, the typical, this is the year I'm looking for, and this is the price range. And I didn't care where in the state, just somewhere in the state. And, and to me, if they look kind of spooky or creepy, I would go investigate, do like a mini investigation at the house. My realtor knew exactly what I was doing. And so we would bring in some, you know, equipment and, you know, spend like an hour or two in, in hopes of getting something and to de- decide. So I actually had picked the Boyd house. I really liked that one, but I wasn't sure. And at this point, I'm driving all over Minnesota. So I decided to enrave the help of a medium that I trust. And she would look at photos of the houses and she would say, yes, there's one here. She said in the particular with the Boyd house, she said, there's, there's six of them there. And what I find interesting is she said, the first night that you stay there, she said, there's a man who likes to garden in the back and he comes in through the back door all the time and you'll hear him the first night you stay there. So it was interesting that she said the first night that you stay there because I hadn't even looked at the house yet. So she probably had an inkling I was going to purchase the house. So in retrospect, I found that that little statement a little bit interesting. All right. Now, she's pointing out these places. Oh, there's a ghost in there. There's one in here. There's one in there. Is she getting any information of why the ghosts are there? Are they trapped? Are they electing to be there? What uh, What can you tell us about that? Um, we didn't really get into to who and what and why. Um, you know, she's she does it as a favor for me, so she doesn't you know get into great great depths of, of things. But she did say that there were two children in the upstairs um, room and the one little boy hides in the closet and the older one who's his sister protects him. And then there's uh, two women, one paces in the back and one's kind of in the main room. And then there's the man, of course, that's there. And we have kind of been finding with some of things that we've gotten versus EVPs and things that we ask on the spirit box, we are finding correlation of men, women, and children being in that home. So it's been quite interesting to try to find out who, what, and why is there. So based on things that I find and that other people are getting, hopefully we can kind of piece this puzzle all together for everyone. And then we can kind of move forward with, uh, you know, working with these spirits of, of why they're there. So you, she, she kind of helps you find this house. You go right. in. Now, when you get the access, are you talking to the realtor about, uh, yeah, we're, you know, I'm looking for something that's kind of paranormally active. Well, the, the realtor I work with um, actually sold me my house, but I wasn't looking for a haunted house. So as she got to know me, we had talked about the paranormal and, you know, it's, it's not any, not at her cup of tea. It scares her to death, but she's really fascinated by what I do. So when I called her up and said, hey, can you help me buy a haunted house? Because you know what I do. So it's not weird for me to call up somebody and tell them what I'm doing. So she was more than willing to help me do that. So we, um, yeah, so that's what we would do. We'd go and do a little mini investigations to, and hope, hopefully get some, some evidence. And when we did the Boyd house, I had a REM pod and that went off in about eight minutes. And then I was also running a spirit box and I had some women's voice. One was like, who are you? You know, because she's probably, this is like their first time really having anybody in the house for like eight months. And now I'm talking to them where the other people who live there never did. So it's probably a whole new experience for them too. And we had gotten a couple names and things like that. So based on that, I was, you know, between the medium, the evidence I got. And then I was like, well, gosh, now I'm not, you know, I'm putting a lot of money into this. Is this something I should do? I'm, I'm just going to ask the owners. <laughs> so we did ask the owners, and they had experience paranormal activity in the home as well. What was that like? I mean, were they pretty forthcoming with telling you the story, or were they kind well, of hesitant? They, 
she was real hesitant. She was a, an older lady. And, you know, back in the day, you didn't really talk about that stuff because people thought you were crazy. So she said that she always felt like there was something funny about the house. And she said that she would hear old-fashioned music playing. She would hear footsteps. Um, the kids themselves, um, actually, interesting, the one of them grew up in the house, just stopped by recently. So I had her in for a little tour, and she told me all kinds of fun stuff. But she said she would lay in bed at night, and she would see this black figure right standing right outside the attic door all the time. Um, they would just hear things walking around her um I think it was her brother and his friend were like running through the house and they thought it was their grandpa sitting in the chair. So they just said, hi, grandpa. And they just kept on going. And it turns out he was never there. So it just, they had had some just real small things, nothing major, you know, I, and from what I'm finding, none of these spirits here are, are you know, disgruntled about anything. So I think they're at peace with the people who are there. Why don't we do this? Let's so take a quick break. Had... We'll come back. We'll get into, um, you know, kind of fleshing out the story here and this history, the house, the the type of paranormal activity taking place there, and what it's like to actually have a haunted location to your disposal at any time. Uh, is our guest noticing more and more activity the more she has the lights on? We'll find out. Stay tuned. The haunting of the Boyd House continues right here on Beyond the Darkness. It's it's not always easy to confide in family and friends. And the best advice comes from people who are unbiased. Take it from me. Take it from Tim. We're somebody who've been through a lot in our lives. And we know that by being open on the show, many of you have as well. And many of you are seeking help and guidance, if you will. The new year is upon us. Well, check out Talkspace Online Therapy. Because they match you with a licensed therapist trained to be an active, non-judgmental listener. With therapy, there's no you know one-size-fits-all. Talkspace therapists are trained in more than 40 specialities. You'll get stress management techniques, communication skills, um, even practical tips to to just help you start to feel your best and your therapist will never bring opinions to the table so you can just freely share whatever it is that's on your mind and it's affordable talkspace gives you a month of any time access do you hear that tim any time access mm-hmm. the price of just one in-person therapy session and their expertise is second to none they have specialities that include depression, anxiety, substance abuse, trauma, relationships, food and eating, and more. They're clinically proven. In one academic study, Talkspace users reported a 50% drop. That's massive. A 50% drop in anxiety after as little as three months. And 80% of participants in another study said Talkspace was as effective or possibly even more effective than in-person therapy. A lot of times, Tim, when you don't have to face somebody, you could be a little bit more open. You have that kind of mask of anonymity. Although they know you, being open and allowing your true feelings to come forward when you feel maybe somebody isn't judging you or looking at you, and you, you kind of get that ability to say what you want, be as open as you want, because that's when the real healing begins. And it is very secure. Talkspace, they encrypt and protect your information, and they use bank-level security technology. It's private. It's confidential support of a dedicated therapist from the privacy of your device, anywhere, at any time. Listen, we all need help navigating life's ups and downs. Talkspace offers the support that you need, and they do it at a very affordable price. Our listeners... Beyond the Darkness can get $100 off their first month by using code DARKNESS at Talkspace.com. Let Dave and Tim lead you through the darkness at Talkspace.com. Use that code to save $100 off your first month. They're going to match you with a therapist for just a fraction of the price of traditional therapy at Talkspace.com. Or download the app. But make sure to use code DARKNESS to get $100 off your first month. 
That's Talkspace.com, T-A-L-K-S-P-A-C-E.com, promo code DARKNESS. The new year is here. The new you is right around the corner. 50% reduction in anxiety after three months. Oh, but Dave, that's three months. And if you don't do it in three months, you're going to still feel the same you do right now. Why not be proactive and do it at an affordable cost? Now you have access any time that's best for you. And you don't have to do it in person. You can do it through the app, over the phone. Do this for yourself. Give the gift to yourself for the the mental health you need, for the break you need, and to have somebody who is able to listen and help. They will never judge. They are there to help you. That's all. Talkspace.com. Use that code DARKNESS and get $100 off your first month. Hey guys, have you checked out the official Lakers podcast yet? It's better than ever this season. Join hosts Mike Trudell and co-host Aaron Larsoul every Monday night as they discuss the Lakers news of the day, break down the games from the week, and have exclusive interviews from players, coaches, and staff. This week, the Lakers take on the Clippers in a Christmas Day showdown. Be sure to tune in to the official Lakers podcast to get all the game highlights. Beyond the Darkness. All right, we are back. Jill Shelley, our guest. We're talking about the Boyd House. And the house is located in southwest Minnesota in the small town of Boyd. It's a four-story, 2,100-square-foot home built in 1901, located at the edge of town and was very close to the uh, Sioux Reservation line. The deed itself goes back to 1884 when the land was owned by the Pacific and Minneapolis Railroad. Now, have you spoken, Jill, to the Sioux tribes and tribe leaders out there about the area? Is there any specifics that you were able to maybe uncover regarding the property itself? Uh, Nothing as far as the Native American situation, but that's a good point. So I guess I hadn't thought about check into that. Um, The only thing I do know is this kind of reading some history uh, from the county, and I'm not going to say it because I'm not very good at French. But it's like La Prairie or something counting. I know I slaughtered that, everyone. Um, so that was very heavily Native American territory back in the day. So I do know, I can't remember, I think it was maybe the 1700s. I guess it was so cold that they had like well over 100 Native Americans freeze to death. Um, so there, there was that kind of a tragedy happened. That was about the only thing I found as, as far as that. Like I said, we're still um, doing more research. I have to get out to the historical society in that area to get some more research done on the house. And like I said, having people in there too helps kind of develop some things that are going on there as well. And we're starting to talk more to the town folk and getting some more history around the place and things like that. Well, if you don't mind, talk to me a little bit about, um, again, you know, owning a place like this is different than going to visit a place. You know, there there's a lot of controversy in the field of paranormal investigations for people that run locations like this. Do you do things to help clear the spirits? Do you try to keep them? What what's the what's the protocol you have in place? Oh uh, well, I guess it's it, for me right now. It's more than research. I do try to ask them if there's something I can do for them. Maybe they're content, you know, to stay there. So I guess as far as sending them on their way was not something I had considered for that. Um, for me, oh, I don't know. I think a lot of people may, I wouldn't say may, I shouldn't speak for anyone actually, but some some may be in just for the actual monetary value. For me, I, I try to keep the cost low, but enough to cover my overhead. And all the money I have received for it goes back into my house. 
um, because there are there are maintenance things. It does need a new roof. It is old. I want to keep it. I want to restore it back to the way it was. I currently have like the old Victorian furniture, so I'm trying to bring it back to the way it was and, and to help restore it from there, and also providing a nice research center for people who do the paranormal activity, so that they can come and they can learn. Eventually, you know, we'll do different things, you know, different events, different classes, just to kind of get people involved. And, you know, if we, we start doing really good, then, you know, I can start donating to local charities and things like that. But, you know, this is a slow process. It's going to take time to get there, but it's just kind of what I envision of where we're going to kind of be going with this house. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. We're, we're also compelled by the paranormal, the thought of ghosts, a place to go visit ghosts. And then there's that other, that kind of ick factor of, but am I, doing something wrong by keeping ghosts or, or, you know, kind of treating it like a sideshow. And certainly Tim and I have been out to many locations and have hosted many different events. And, uh, you know, I'm on the Holzer file. So it's, you know, obviously careers are made on investigating these things as well and going out to these locations. When you work with your mediums, do the mediums tell you that these spirits are here of their own volition or are they trapped somehow? Um, I haven't really worked with a ton. Like I said, I just worked with the one that just kind of helped me get the place. She didn't say anything about that. I know I've had a couple of people in there that say they're mediums, but again, they haven't relayed to me whether the spirits want in or out. You know, they've been there for so long. It's like, do they want to stay? Why are they staying? You know, again, these are things we don't know. And as, you know, like we were saying too, as far as people thinking that they're like keeping ghosts, I don't own them and I can't make them do things. I can make them interact. So they are their own individual type person. I guess if you look at it that way, right. Um, Do they ever seem to get frustrated by people coming and going and investigating or do they seem to enjoy the interaction as well? Well, I I think they enjoy it. You know, I, and it's, I, I talk to them. Like I said, I spent two months there pretty much almost every weekend getting things ready. So I would just talk to them, you know, it's like, Oh, this weekend I'm going to a wedding. Have you been to a wedding? You know, just like they were there, you know? So I think they kind of enjoyed the company and I kind of explained what I was doing, that I was going to have other people come in and talk to them and interact. And I would appreciate if they did that kind of situation. And it, it seems to work. People have been getting lots of activity when they're there. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, it's, you know, that, that is part of the, the issue I've always run into with this is just, yeah, just trying to question and, you know, what are the ghosts thoughts and why are they there in some of these cases? What can you do? I mean, I certainly, you know, when I've gone to visit locations, I always leave with a ceiling prayer, just asking that any spirits that are lost or forgotten find their way home. And, you know, some of the locations we visited specifically asked us, please don't try to cross our spirits over. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, let them stay here. So again, as intention, you know, the, the homeowner, uh, or business proprietor, uh, in charge of that, it's, it's kind of a weird dynamic, but it does seem that, you know, maybe we're looking at it wrong. Maybe it's not as though they're trapped here. They elect to stay there or they're living a parallel life there and we might be the ghosts to them. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting way to look at it. Well, let's, you know, I'd love to talk a little bit more about some of the other uh, weird stuff that goes on. Um, you know, what are what are some of the more bizarre paranormal aspects and, and uh, encounters people have reported to you? Well, I have a journal that I have people write in. So if they don't actually hit me up, uh, I usually find it in the journal when I come to visit. Uh, A lot of equipment interaction. People get different actions with the REM pods. They have the periscopes, uh, the flashlights. Um, Some people have K2 hits. I'm not a big person of the K2 meter. Um, People have been touched, like they feel tugging on their shirt or their pants or their blankets being tugged on. Uh, They have heard audible voices, mostly children. And... um, People have also seen some objects moving, like they'll have a doll one way and they'll come back, it'll be the other way. I uh, recently had somebody tell me that the kitchen faucet turned on by itself. People have told me the bathroom light turned on by itself. People have had doors shut 
or they'll hear them shut. And footsteps is a real common one that we hear at the house, too. So I think that's pretty much a lot of... Somebody had, like, the dryer. We have a dry washer dryer there. They said the dryer kept opening and closing. The door kept opening and closing on the dryer throughout the night. Oh, really? So it opened and shut on its own. Um, have, have there ever been scary moments? I mean, if we've got the light on and spirits or or other forces are attracted to attention... Are you ever worried that that might bring something unexpected to you? I'm hoping not. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping everybody I have is, is there is really friendly and hopefully nobody um, does anything to bring any negative energies to the place, you know, because you just never know what people are going to do when you're not there. Um, That's true. But so far, I think everything's just, it's been real friendly. For me, I think, and I guess it wasn't scary as much as it was unexpected, which, you know, again, brings me back to the psychic. On the first night that I stay there, she said, I'll hear him come through the door. So I happen to be walking by um, the door that goes to the basement, and then there's like four stairs, and then there's a back door. But it's so airtight that there was no way that this was a backdraft of any sort because I've checked all this out to make sure. Um, as I was walking by the basement door, it just pounded so loud like somebody took their fist and went BAM! And the whole thing shook and I jumped about five feet because I didn't wasn't expecting it. And of course, you know, I'm tugging on the door and opening the door and checking the airflow and there was nothing that could have caused the, the, the sound that that door produced plus the whole shaking of the door um so that that kind of threw me off a little bit but i wasn't scared i just said hey do it again they never did but <laughs> and yeah I have, just um, that that's always been something too you know with the idea of i don't you know, we don't encourage people to investigate their own homes if you have something maybe have somebody else come in and investigate it so that you don't show the you know intention to to amp up activity having somebody else kind of come in and and examine it in a different way um because there you know sometimes it does bring unwanted activity to the home do you get weirdly recorded activity from spirits that don't seem to have anything to do with your place um you know as far as like a like an evp or a spirit box or yeah whatever it might be um no, you know, like I said, it's hard to say because we don't really know who's at this location right now. Um, so I, I'm, I'm assuming everybody who's coming through probably is part of the house. But I, again, I can't guarantee that. I keep getting so many different names that were way beyond the six that this medium told me that were there. So I don't know, you know, are they just passing through? Are we gaining more? You know, it's, you know, by the more people coming in and creating, you know, the different energies are more becoming attracted. Is the house becoming a beacon? You know, it's hard to say. It just, it seems that the more people I've had in, the more activity has been happening. You know, and I, I notice it too for myself when I, I haven't been down as much as I was in the beginning. So I kind of notice a little bit different, difference to the house when I come in there sometimes. Yeah, I would guess so. Uh, it probably does have a strange vibe. Are you, you know, in in dealing with these type of spirits then, do you look often to, um, you know, trying to communicate using them with spirits close to you? You know, once you've started to bridge this relationship, I wonder if utilizing them to become communicators to other spirits would be possible. Has that been something you've tried? Uh, no, I have not. I have not tried that. I do know, you know, like I said, I'm at the point in my research, um, again, started to, to like, oh, we just need to prove there's something, and then you kind of take it from there. But now I kind of want to know, what's it like on the other side? You know, what, what goes on? You know, so I'm, I'm trying to learn. I ask them questions a lot. You know, like, do you meet other people? Do Does your family come and get you when you pass away? There's all kinds of those questions that, you know, I try to keep getting the answers, you know, either through an EVP or on the spirit box and, in, and trying to get the same consistent answer, even in different locations. So then that I feel more comfortable saying that, hey, that is a true answer because I've heard it from different locations, same different spirits. 
you know, that kind of thing. So I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out what the heck's going on. So I'm hoping by with these spirits, you know, becoming more comfortable with me that maybe they'll be able to pass some of that information along to me if they're allowed to. I don't know if they're even allowed to pass that on, but that's what, that's where I'm working for. Are there other houses in the area that seem to, you know, harbor this kind of activity as well? I haven't really talked to it. It's, it's, seems like the town some of them are like oh yeah the house is on it oh okay and other people are like it is not so it just kind of depends on who you're talking to i haven't heard anybody i think i had one comment on facebook of somebody who's in town that said oh you should have them at your house and then of course i hit them up hey if you're interested but i never heard so it, i don't think i'm the only one in town it's just a lot of people don't like to talk about it yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and I guess you understand to a degree on that, um, you know, what's happening. Do, do they reveal many names at all when, when you're doing the investigations or do the people there? Uh, I, on the spirit box and stuff, I've got names as far as anybody collaborating or, or saying, Hey, yeah, that person did live there. I haven't gotten, you know, any, anything like that. And so I'm still, all the names I get or names that people send me, I jot it down because I'm hoping through digging through the history. And I, you know, I've been getting a little bit more and getting some family tree history done that hopefully I can start finding out who these people are. But again, if they're from, you know, back from 1884 or, you know, even the 1700s, there's like really no records of people. So <laughs> it's, it might be a tough, tough way to prove it. So just, I guess I'm going to have to go with mainly consistency if people start getting the same names, the same. You know, well, it's same nice now that there's type. things like newspaper.com and so many different resources um, because you can, you know, a lot of these places you can start to uncover news stories with the names of these people that, that are there. Mm -hmm. So it'll be fascinating. Now, how long have you actually owned the house? Uh, I bought it this year in the, in the spring. So when I first bought it, the day we went to the historical society, I had not gotten my abstract deed yet. So we pretty much did history on the town, tried to see if we could find anything on the house. Um, but it was a really good start because we have a lot of names of the founders, which going back to my deed, they did own the land at one time. So then there was a little bit of story back of, uh, as far as that. So it was like the, one of the, probably the earliest owners in like 1910 was Mr. Eckert. And he was actually, um, the justice of the peace of the town and also owned the big like merchandising store. Um, and now that I'm uncovering that there's like these little coins he used to hand out. So, you know, I'm just finding out little information of, of different, different things about the people of the house, whether they're haunting it or not, it's still kind of fun to have the history of who was there and what did they do and, you know, things like that. All right. Now going in with, uh, you know, we, we don't have much time left together here. And, and, uh, I'm just curious with where you're going to take this into the future. What is the, the concept? I mean, do you want to turn this into a, a full on paranormal research center for people? Uh, is it something that you make available year round? Uh, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, it is, it is available year round to, to come. It's a little treacherous more in the winter, of course. Um, but yeah, I just kind of make it a research for everybody to come, enjoy, have fun. You know, it, it, they're on their own. So I'm, I'm trusting them to my house that they're not going to wreck it. I'm entrusting that they're not going to agitate the spirits, that they're not going to, you know, run a Ouija board. That's my big thing. Um, but I just want everybody to, to be open to learn and, and, you know, get the answers that they're looking for as well. Very cool. Well, I'd be interested when you talk to the local Sioux Nation, talk to somebody there, if they're familiar with any history, if they're, if you're backed up to that property, uh, are they familiar with any kind of, um, activity out there? And if so, are they willing to talk about it? Yeah. Like I said, I was, I'd like to check in. I don't, you know, on the little plot map, it's probably less than a mile away where that line was drawn. So, uh, you know, back there, something had to happen between, you know, Native Americans and Americans back back in the day still being that close, I would assume in something. Very cool. Yeah. Well, let us let us know. How about other activity up there? I mean, you guys are 
kind of out in the boonies. Is there Bigfoot activity, alien activity, UFO sightings, anything strange like that? I haven't haven't known, but I seriously wouldn't uh, put it past. Like I said, there is a lot of farm fields. It you know when when you come there, it's, you take off a a little tiny highway. And you come another 25 minutes driving through nothing but cornfields, and then there's like this little town, like right in the middle of all these farm fields. <laughs> it, you know, I haven't uh, talked to a lot of the locals yet um, about any of the, you know, other activities that, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, keep us abreast of the situation as it continues to go. We'd love to know more of the strange uh, kind of uh, issues. Now, people, we, we do have a link up to your website. Um, can they find pictures, videos, EVP, evidence, things like that on the site? Yeah, on our website, we do have uh, some of the videos that I've collected from the times that I have been investigating. And then I also have a collection of the very first team that was ever in there. They got quite a few EVPs, so I kind of put that together. And then as people send me more of their evidence and things like that, I'll be putting it on the website and also on our Facebook page, too, for Boyd House. There's a lot of stuff in and, and our current current happenings, what's going on. You can find a lot of that information on there as well. All right. Uh, we will put a link up to the website. So, folks, you can look on there and find it for yourselves. That's it for today. We will be back with you, True Crime Tuesday, this week. And uh, we'll be back again next week with more of the best in paranormal talk radio. So have a safe and happy New Year's, Jill. Thank you for joining us today and, and giving us you know, some insight into the Boyd House. Yes, thanks for having me. It was fun, and you guys have a happy New Year as well. All right, and uh, folks, please be careful this uh, this holiday. Don't drink and drive. Don't text and drive. Get to where you're going safe and sound. Call an Uber, call a Lyft, call a friend. Don't get in that car if you've been drinking. Even if you think you've got it handled, don't take the chance because it's not just your life you're putting in your hands. It could be mine or Tim's or anybody else's. And you don't want to impact other people's lives with your one bad decision. So please, please consider it's not just you that you're affecting when you do this. That's it for this year. We will return with brand new episodes of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio as we launch into 2020 together right here on Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the Darkness.